A little bit cooler in here than out there, right? <laughs> if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, we will pick up where we left off last week, and we will actually finish chapter 10 uh, this week, which is a good thing, um, a very good thing. This book, just as a matter of quick review, it is, um, as I believe we probably said every single week now, it is everything in these last days uh, that God has spoken to us in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ. And we've gotten to explore in that just the depth of who Jesus is and what he's done specifically for us, for the, for the sins of this world, for the people of this world. And throughout, as we've kind of explored who he is, we keep coming back to this idea almost every single chapter, this idea that Jesus is better in all things. <laughs> and Jesus is better than anything that the world can offer us. And he is also better than anything that we can offer to God. I mean, there's been a two-sided coin to this whole thing. He's better than anything we'll see out there. He's better than anything we can give back to God. And so we give him. We come under his sacrifice. But he is, as we have learned through this book, he is our peace. And he's our strength. He's our shelter. He's our joy and our hope. He is literally our salvation. He is our life. And the world might laugh at that, just going through a laundry list of all the things that Jesus is to us, and they say, well, Jesus is just your answer for everything. And all we could say to that is, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and Jesus is better. He is better. He is the answer to everything we will ever face, good, bad, indifferent. He is the answer. <laughs> First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 tell us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. In good time, in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He is the answer in all things. Uh, last week, though, we began to work through the practicality of this letter. And the encouragements that we saw last week, and it's going to continue on roughly through the end of the book, this practicality, but the encouragements that we saw last week, they were simple, but they were profound. Absolutely. And it started simply with draw near to God. Enter into his presence with a true heart, in full assurance of faith. You know, don't draw near to him in arrogance. Don't draw near to him in your self-righteousness. Draw near to God with a true heart, rightly recognizing who you are before him. Rightly recognizing what your heart is before him, and rightly recognizing who he is. It's an honest recognition both ways, who he is and who you are. In the same exact breath, when we draw close to him that way, it is an honest recognition of who is God, him, or you. It's an immediate check and balance in the situations that we face in life. Do you come to God attempting to impose your will on him, or do you come to God seeking his will for you? Check your prayer life in that. I had to check mine this week. What am I doing right now? Is this your will, or am I looking for my will? <laughs> And we were told to draw near to be sprinkled, to draw near with hearts sprinkled. We were told to draw near with bodies washed with water. And we saw that we can have neither sprinkled hearts nor washed bodies without Jesus. We can't give, we can't draw near to him and what we need to draw near to him in if we are drawing near in anything other than Jesus. We were told to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And we were told to consider one another. And in doing so, in doing that one simple thing, in approaching each other in consideration of them, we stir up love and good works. We were told not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves before God. And when we assemble, we were told to exhort one another, you know, to encourage one another, and to come alongside each other in the things that we are going through, that the Lord has placed each other in our lives to be there for. Don't just come together to be here. And there are people who hold on to that verse and say, I'm going to be in church regardless. I mean, we don't take attendance. <laughs> That's not why we come. Don't just come to be here. That's not the importance of this command. Come together to be a part of the work that God is doing through this body of believers. Gather together specifically to allow God to work through the exact gifts that he's given you. That's why we gather together, not to show our face, and not to get a gold star, not to get a perfect attendance sheet, we gather together to be a part of what's going on in the work that God is doing 
And we each play a part in that. Our theme as we go through this book, it comes out of Psalm 95, verse 7 and 8, which says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So as we go through what we're going to go through tonight, this is a difficult section of Scripture. As we go through this, hear his voice in what we cover tonight. And hear it with a soft heart. Hear it with a new heart toward what, if you've been through this a hundred times, hear it new tonight. Hear his voice and what he wants to say. So we'll just dive right in with all that being said. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. If we sin willfully, uh, we, squir- we start squirming when we read this. This is a hard section of Scripture because each one of us, if we're completely honest, each one of us has sinned willfully. We have. You might have done it today. <laughs> I probably did it today. I don't even realize. But many will read this section of Scripture right here and they'll start to worry, have I gone too far? Have I gone too far in having sinned? Should I have fearful expectation of judgment? Should I expect that I'm going to be devoured in fire as an adversary of the Lord because I have sinned willfully? And understand in considering what we consider tonight, this here speaks to the prevailing attitude of the heart. When we talk about this, we talk about one who is absolutely unrepentant. One who just comes before the Lord and says, I will live this life this way regardless of what God says and what his word says. You know, I will continually dull and deny the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life. That is scary, scary ground to go through life that way. Because at the base, it comes down to the exact question that we just went over a couple minutes ago. Who is God in your life? Is it him or is it you? And if it's you, there's a huge problem in that. We continue to delve around in ground that the modern church spends a whole lot of time debating over that they really don't have to. One of the most common questions that you will see out there in the modern church is, can I lose my salvation? And we've discussed this several times now in several different passages of Scripture. Can I lose my salvation? There are two basic types of people out there that wrestle with this question. One asks out of guilt over what they have done. They ask it out of something that they've fallen into, you know. (laughs) They're worried that they've messed up too many times. They're worried that God's grace will run out on them when they ask this question. They knew better. They knew the word. They knew God's commands to them. They knew exactly what they should be doing, and they absolutely blew it. They did the exact opposite thing. And now they're scared to death that a verse like this speaks to their current state in God. That a verse like this speaks to their eternal destination now. And that there is no longer a sacrifice to cover their transgression. And the thing is, and I've told you this before, I don't worry about that person. I don't worry about that person. That person needs grace. That's what they need to be met with in that question. They need grace. Absolutely. This is a person who is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit when they ask that question. This is a person who lives in recognition that Jesus is Lord and no one else. Otherwise, they wouldn't wrestle with this question. They know they've sinned. They confess that sin before him. They want to make it right. And they are struggling mightily to get there. But they are saved. They're saved. I mean, understand, in these things, you just keep giving the sin over to God. You keep giving the sin over to God. You keep surrendering your heart over to him, and he removes the sin from your life. He will. Some things he takes away instantly and permanently, and you never think about them again. Hardly even notice that they're gone. They're just not there. He removes them. And then there are others that it is a piece-by-piece dismantling of that sin in your life over many years, maybe a lifetime. But the base cry of the heart, regardless of what happens immediately in the moment with that sin, the base cry of the heart is, this sin does not belong in my life. This sin certainly does not belong in the presence of God. He is faithful to deliver you out of that sin. The other type of person, though, 
Very often they ask this question as a means of sticking around and playing games in the gray areas with God. You know, I can let that sin hang around in my life because I have grace. I can hide it under the cover of grace because it's grace. I can do what I want. (laughs) I won't lose my salvation. They live this life in the expression of the license of their flesh. And they attempt to dress that up as liberty in Jesus Christ. And we have talked so many times, liberty is freedom from the sin. License is continuing on in what you are supposed to have been delivered out of. They approach it just as a means of what gymnastics can I do with God's word to make my continuation in this sin acceptable when they ask that question. And we're the first type of person asked this question out of the worry of having gone too far. This type of person asked the question out of how far can I go? And in that, while the two types ask the exact same question, they come at it from two very different hearts. And that's the thing. Everything with Jesus Christ comes down to the heart. Everything in him comes down to the heart. If your heart is truly his, if it truly belongs to him, you don't want to see how far you can go before you've crossed that line. You don't even want to test those waters. And this is supposed to be a love relationship with him. So love him with your life. I mean, love him the way that you want to be loved, unwavering unattached to anything that will drive you apart from him. What it says here is if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So keeping that in mind, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 51. You know this psalm very well, but we're going to look at it a little closer tonight. Not super close. (laughs) Just going to hit some of the high points, but a little bit closer. And just to set the scene, and again, you know this already, but it's good just to reset. And David, as he cried out to God in the aftermath of his willful sin with Bathsheba, and in the aftermath of his willful sin in taking the life of Uriah, her husband, these were willful sins. Understand that. David's sins were not simply missing the mark. It wasn't just falling short. What happened with Bathsheba, it was willful And it was intentional. And what happened with Uriah, it was willful, and it was intentional. It was calculated. It was cowardly. Two separate sins, and both of these sins, understand this piece, both of these sins were punishable by the law. According to the law, adultery was a capital offense. And murder was certainly a capital offense. I mean, have you ever thought about that? David should have been put to death for this sin, according to the law. And that would have been just had it happened that way. But had that happened, think about that. Think about the promise of the Messiah. Think about the line coming through Solomon, who at that point (laughs) wasn't to be yet. We wouldn't have had Jesus had he been punished according to the letter of the law. He cried out to God in repentance. And he wrote the words down in Psalm 51. In verse 1, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. If you drop all the way down to verse 10, it says, he said, Create in me a clear heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In verse 11, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And we read this whole psalm tonight when you get home. And read the whole thing. It is worth reading and considering in light of what we're going to go through in Hebrews tonight. But in verse 12 here in Psalm 51, it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors. That is, I will teach willful disobeyers, those for whom the law made no provision for. I mean, think about that. Not a single offering in the law of Moses covered willful disobedience. Understand that. Not a single offering in the law of Moses covered willful sin. There's a paradigm shift in what David is writing here. And it's huge. (laughs) And it strikes to the heart of God's love and his mercy toward mankind. 
You know, God, I'm guilty of your law. That's what he's saying. I am deserving of death in this. But I'm appealing to the grace that you have shown mankind from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. I mean, God gave Adam and Eve one law, and they went and they broke that law willfully. I mean, understand that. Eve didn't trip and fall on the fruit mouth first. It wasn't an accident. It was intentional sin. It was willful sin, and God spared them in his mercy. He could have started over if he wanted, but he spared them. There was a breaking of fellowship in that willful disobedience, but he still provided a covering for them in their sin. David appealed to that grace as he penned the words to this psalm. He threw his life upon God's mercy, knowing that the law demanded his life and what he had done. And he says here, I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. And this word converted in the Hebrew, it is shub. (laughs) Shub. It means to turn back. I will teach willful sinners your ways, and they shall return to you. Even just in putting those words to the scroll, David was teaching us. He was teaching willful disobeyers God's ways and God's grace that we might return to him. And he was teaching us these things at a point in his life where there was no sacrifice remaining to cover what he had done. He knew there was nothing that could cover what he had done. He knew that what he had done was punishable by death, so he appealed to God's grace. And if you drop down to verse 17, we see the answer to what we're wrestling over tonight. He said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. That's not a sacrifice of the law. Understand that there is no offering that talks about bringing a broken and a contrite heart before God. That is not a sacrifice of the law. These are sacrifices of God. So David, who was guilty absolutely of willful disobedience, Guilty of transgression that was punishable by his death. And he was guilty before the entire nation that he was king over. I mean, never lose sight of that. They knew what their king had done. He was guilty before the people that he ruled over. But he came before God with this heart that we read in these words. He came before God with a broken and a contrite heart. He came before God with a heart believing the truth that surely he was deserving of death but a heart believing deeply and steadfastly in God's mercy and in his loving kindness. He said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And just some quick translation for you, that word broken in the Hebrew, it translates more solidly to burst. In this word contrite, it translates more accurately to collapsed. A burst and a collapsed heart. Realize This is Jesus. This is Jesus. That's exactly what he offered on the cross was a burst and a collapsed heart as blood and water flowed when they shoved that spear into him. Come before the Lord earnestly with that sacrifice and you will always find mercy. Come before the Lord with a burst heart and a collapsed heart. Always there will be forgiveness. Always that heart belongs to Jesus. Understand that. But if you come before the Lord in your license, you know, if you come before him just trying to play games with his grace and live life however you want to live it, with no regard and no recognition of the sacrifice that has been paid for your sin, if it is nothing to you, that the sin you want to continue on in is the same sin that put your death to an, or you put your Savior to an agonizing death on the cross. There is no mercy in that. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Because as David, in the fallout from his willful sin, cried out, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. There is forgiveness in true repentance always, no matter how many times You've brought that repentance before the Lord. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ always and in his broken and contrite heart, his collapsed and burst heart. 
But if you slip into the thinking that you can find mercy anywhere else, in anything else, you know, just push yourself through another battery of works and rituals, and thus you receive that mercy, you're not going to find it. There is no mercy in that. Everything that is built up to this point in this letter, understand, it has established this truth without question for us. Jesus' sacrifice is superior. It is superior to all things, and in that it has rendered all other sacrifices obsolete. There is thus no longer a sacrifice for sins through any other form, through any other avenue that can appropriately deal with your sin. It doesn't exist any longer. Only the sacrifice of Jesus. Like we said in Romans a couple of weeks ago, our purpose here, it is just to continue on in his goodness. That's all he asks of us. Just continue on in his goodness. No matter how badly you've stumbled, no matter how hard you've fallen, and no matter how willfully you've disobeyed him, Turn back to him. Cling to his goodness and live. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. And these sacrifices are offered by his son. And they are offered through his son, who offered his broken body and his burst and collapsed heart for you first. But if you want to flip back to Hebrews, it says... Chapter, or in verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? So, I mean, just consider the imagery being used here. To sin willfully to sin de deliberately against God, to live in the license of your flesh instead of in the freedom from sin under the cover of God's grace, it is to trample Jesus Christ underfoot. Trample the Son of God underfoot. It is to dilute his precious blood into something common, something every day. It is to live in insult to the spirit of grace. When one turns away from the provision that God has made for our sin, understand, when one decides that there is another way or another truth or another life, that truly is an insult to the spirit of grace. It is to say, if effectively, I want something other than Jesus for my justification. There no longer remains a sac sacrifice for sin in that. You won't find justification before God in anything else. In verse 30, it says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing. I mean, don't play games with God. It's serious business. Come to him in a right heart and with a right spirit under the right name. Don't try to come to him under any other name or any other means. Come to him humble and repentant and obedient. If we reach the point where we are dictating our lives to God, you know, where we're using his word to try and justify where we're taking him and what we're doing to him, instead of listening to his word to seek his guidance for where he wants to take us, that is very dangerous ground. I saw it said last week, so many in the modern church are apt to lay hold of Jesus as their Savior without ever proclaiming him as their Lord. When in reality, we are only saved by accepting Jesus as our Lord. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But when we are carried in by the wounded hands of his Son, we find peace and rest and strength and life we find eternal assurance simply by being in his hands. Verse 32 says, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me, in my chains, that's basically the one thing we know about the writer of this book. They were in chains. 
Take from it what you will. (laughs) And joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So in the background of everything, again, as we go through this letter, the original reader of this letter, there were many among the initial intended audience who were considering returning to the system of the law, who were considering returning to a lesser sacrifice. And in that, the warning that's given here rings very true. If you leave for a lesser sacrifice, if that becomes what justifies you before God, instead of the perfect blood that was shed by Jesus Christ, What sacrifice remains for your sins? What sacrifice can match his? And the answer, of course, is none. There is no sacrifice remaining for sins outside of Jesus. And that's where, again, we return to the truth that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. We read earlier in the same chapter, in chapter 10, a couple of weeks ago, sacrifice and offering God did not desire. God doesn't want the ritual or the work that you're considering leaning on instead of his son. He doesn't want those things in place of Jesus' completion. He just wants your heart. He wants your heart and he wants your life. And in what's written here, there's just a real subtle elbow to the ribs to this original reader, you know, to those who are considering returning to the system of the law. And what it's written here, it says it's not just that God doesn't want the sacrifices that you want to return to. I mean, that's the big thing. Absolutely, it's that, but that's not all. Just as a reminder to you who want to return to the law, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. You were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. Your goods were plundered. The subtext here is don't forget who did this to you. It was the system that you want to return to. The religious leaders of the nation Israel, they inflicted great pain and great punishment on the church. And the writer's jabbing at the believer here, who's considering this in the back of their minds. You want to return to what caused such great trial and strife in your lives. Why would you want to do that when truly you have all you will ever need right now? Don't do it. This is foolishness. And yet in that, how often are we today stumbled and entangled by the same things that have already caused so much damage and pain in our lives? We've been delivered out of them, but in a moment, you know, something jumps up out of the world and it snares you in temptation like an arrow. And your sin, we say this all the time, your sin, it can only bring destruction. That's all it can do. There is no other fruit to sin, destruction and death in your life and in the lives of those around you. Your sin will plunder your goods. It will do that. It'll make a spectacle of you in your trials and in your sufferings. It'll harm those that you never intended to harm. Don't leave. Don't leave. It doesn't have to be that way. All of the Jesus substitutes, right? The works and the rituals, and the upbringing, all of these things, they have a basis in and of themselves in sin. We dress them up to look righteous, but at their root, they are sinful. (laughs) They have a basis in pride, self-sufficiency. They have a basis in idolatry. You know, just simply looking to anything other than he who died for you, that's idolatry. Because when we do that, structurally speaking, we are setting up for ourselves another God besides the one true God. These things bring about destruction. That's what they do because they are sin. Idolatry is anything that takes the place of Jesus in your life. Pride. Pride is at the root of so much of what we get wrong because we want to protect what people think about us. Don't set aside the goodness and the simplicity of Jesus Christ for something that ultimately will bring you more pain and more suffering. It's just not worth it. But in verse 35, it says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. So these sacrifices that we're talking about tonight, your heart and your life and your mind, these sacrifices, when they are redeemed by Jesus' blood, and when they're given into the Father's care, they bring immediate benefit, an immediate reward in your life, an eternal benefit, an eternal 
reward in your lives. And it does the exact same in the lives of those around you. Don't cast away your confidence in what Jesus has done in exchange for anything you have done. Don't do it. Don't play that game with God. There's great reward simply in resting your faith in Jesus because it removes from you all of the pressure to perform for anyone else. You just live according to how God leads you. And it becomes so simple. Just be his. But in verse 36, it says, For you have need of endurance, so that you, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You have need of endurance. (laughs) So understand this. Understand the promise that you are moving toward in Jesus. He who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. He will not wait. Jesus is not lax in coming back for us. He's not, he hasn't missed his appointment, you know. He's going to come the instant that he's given the go-ahead from God the Father. He will be here. You better believe that. The moment God the Father says it's time, it's here comes the bridegroom right then. Right then. He eagerly awaits his bride. And all the while, in the time in between, he is preparing for us things that are beyond what we can possibly imagine, things that are beyond what we can possibly fathom. What he is preparing, understand it is so much better than the crumbs that we settle for here. And that's all it is here, crumbs that are going to burn and melt in his presence. What he's preparing for us, it will last forever. He will not tarry. He's waiting for the appointed time. And in that, in light of that basic promise, our attitudes must follow his same mold. It shouldn't be what can we explore in the time that we have remaining? What can we cross off of our bucket list? What can we do for ourselves? It should be that our time remaining would be a laser focus on the moment of his return. What will usher his return quicker? Every moment that passes, Every single moment that passes here, it is one moment closer to Jesus returning to bring his church home. I ask you in that, are we living our lives as such? Are we living our lives in that truth? And do we live in eager anticipation of his return? Or I challenge you, are we living in the hope that he doesn't return right now because of what we're entangled in today? Get these things right before him. It's simple. Just give them back to him where he paid for them. Simply by obedience to his word and to his will, every moment that we give to God ushers that moment of his return that much closer. It's that simple. The more moments we give over to him, the more we start to live in eager anticipation and expectation of his coming. Now, the just shall live by faith. By faith. It's not that the just shall live for themselves and for their own pleasures, not by any means. It is not the just shall live by the quality and the quantity of their works. It is not that. It's not the just shall live by the rituals that they take part in. It is the just shall live by faith. By faith. This is a quote that's straight out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And again, as we continue through this letter, any time an Old Testament verse is quoted in this letter, or really anywhere in the New Testament, you have to consider for the Hebrew believer, they knew the entire section of Scripture that that verse would be coming out of. When there's a fragment of a quote like this, it's a touchstone to what was being said in the overall picture in that scroll. (laughs) They were steeped in these Scriptures from the time they were born. They knew the Word of God. They knew what these words tracked to. And really, for us, it should be a touch point for us, too. This was our theme verse when we went through Galatians last summer. Maybe it rings a bell. But the fullness of this verse, the whole verse, it is, Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And that verse, that verse strikes to the heart of everything that we've been going through in this letter. Behold the proud. Behold the proud. The Hebrew reader was proud of the law and proud of the temple. 
and proud of the sacrificial system that they got to partake in, and they were considering returning to the pageantry. You know, they wanted to go back to the show, the things that they could see, the things that they could marvel at. We get so proud today over the things that we even get minimally right in our walks with the Lord. And very often that begins to lead into a trap of letting those landmark moments in our faith become monuments of pride. Behold the proud. I've told you many times now, this is my testimony. My whole life was just pillars of pride. That's all it was, pillars of pride that the Lord allowed to crumble over time. And he allowed them each to crumble publicly. It's just what it is. (laughs) It is the proud who will hold to just a profession of faith a long time ago and then live a life after the pattern of license because of the things they can point to that they believe they did. It's the proud that do that. It's the proud that do that instead of coming rightly before the Lord in humility and in brokenness through his blood. So much of our interpersonal conflict with each other, you know, in our marriages and in our friendships and even in our fellowship here, the conflicts are just steeped in pride. If we could just approach each other, approach the ones that we love in humility, how many things could we avoid that just in the end wasted time? How many conflicts and arguments could we avoid just by approaching in humility, just by the basic recognition, your needs in this moment are more important than mine. I'm okay with that. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. But what it says here is if anyone draws back, you know, if anyone attempts life in Jesus by any means that is not him, (laughs) if they attempt life in Jesus By anything other than a simple governing faith in him, God finds no pleasure in that. And verse 39 says, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. This is just a reminder to the reader again. It is a reminder to us of who we are in Jesus. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, So for anybody who worries over the section of Scripture that we started with tonight, when they worry whether there is no longer a sacrifice for their sins, you are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. Perdition, the word translates literally to ruin or loss or destruction or damnation or waste. That might be the best word of them all. (laughs) In Jesus Christ... We are not of those who draw draw back to waste. We are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And if you approach God in your pride, if you approach God in your own strength, if you approach God in your license and in your rebellion, if you approach him in anything other than what he has provided for you, there is no mercy in that. But when you approach him humbly, in faith, broken and contrite, when you approach him specifically in the name of his son and in love with his son and in obedience to his son, there is salvation of your very soul. All of this really has been a prelude and a buildup to this concept of faith. The just shall live by faith. So if the just live by faith, what does real faith look like? And the writer next week is going to start to define for us what faith is. He's going to do so, or she, (laughs) I don't know. They're going to do so strictly from the examples God has provided throughout Scripture of souls that were humbly surrendered to his way and his will. I have no idea how long we're going to be in chapter 11. I don't. It could be weeks. It's not going to be one week. (laughs) It shouldn't simply be one week. In chapter 11, as it stands, it is a master survey course on the entirety of the faith exhibited in mankind before Jesus arrived on this planet. It is presented in a way that at every single step, it models and points to who Jesus would be and what he would do when he did arrive. It's just a masterpiece. Truly, it is the heart of this letter from God's heart to yours. So don't miss it. Feel free to read ahead. I read it a couple of times. Just see what's there. It's, it's an amazing section of Scripture. And that being said, let's go ahead and pray. 
And Father God, I wish we could see what you see. I wish we could see from where you see. And just through, through the blood of your Son, I wish we could see how you see us. I wish we could see the reality, Lord, of what your, sin, what your Son has paid for and what our sin has actually done. But I know you have spared us from that, Lord, in your grace. And so in that, we just ask that we be able to see you, uh, that you just continue to reveal yourself through your word, and um, that you'd be guiding us, and that you would be drawing us closer to you. And just in everything that we do, and in everything that we're exposed to, that we would just be apt every day, more so than the day before, to turn to your word, and call out your name, and pray through your Holy Spirit, Lord, just to know more of who you are, and to share more of who you are with the world that you've left us in for this exact period of time. Lord, you've placed each one of us during this time to be of service to you, and you intend to use each one of us during this time. So we just, we ask that you'd make us ready, and give us eyes and ears and mouths and hands and feet that are surrendered to whatever it is you're going to do, Lord, and that when you call us to do something, you would fill us with your strength so that it gets done. Lord, not so that we might do it, so that you might use us to do what you want to do. So we just ask, Lord, all these things. We ask for your equipping. We ask for your protection. We ask just to be reminded always of your love for us and that we'd be able to provide that love um, through your provision uh, to those that you place around us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.